ni ohi abei wa no hodu ai oh oh mu mu ga wa ile no homa na oh pa hi o ga ba li ku ga ba ha ba ba li ku ga ba ma ka ni ku ma ku ha ga li ra o hu le wa i ya ka la wa e ha ka anu o le ke ya o hu no ke no ke Hakala la ke ya manu ka o ka o hi aha ma me ho o ha ma wi da le o ka le wa pa ne a pa ne ba i pa ha i ke ya ma mu e Ah I'd like to introduce the next speaker Kate Brahman Kate is a PhD candidate in the Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources at Stanford University. Um, her dissertation research integrates the study of plant water relations with economics and policy to address watershed valuation and conservation. She's leading a project on the Big Island of Hawaii to identify how and to what extent different land cover types produce water supply services. Her aims to inform the creation of a new sort of framework to compensate landowners for the water supplied by their lands, thereby both improving water supply and integrating conservation into the delivery of vital water services. Today, Kate is going to discuss both the biophysical and institutional dimensions of an ecosystem service approach to drinking water and flood control in Hawaii, focusing on her case study in Kona and on more sort of general science and policy needs. Thank you, Kate. Hi, well, we're about halfway through this symposium now, so thanks for sticking with us. I'm gonna take us a little bit closer to home and talk um, about ecosystem services, hydro hydrologic ecosystem services in general, but really try to tie it to the work that I'm doing in Kona um, and how this can really be applicable in Hawaii. Um, what I'm looking at in, in Kona, as Leva said, is really how different kinds of land cover affect water availability for downstream land users and how we might actually manage land differently based on the water services that it's supplying. So I imagine that a lot of you are familiar with this image from Kamehameha schools of an ahupua'a. And I love this image for a whole lot of reasons, but one of them is that I think it really ties together the idea of land use and its connection to water resources. Um, Clearly, land use is defined by water resources. You can grow certain kinds of crops in close proximity to water sources. You do other kinds of cultivation further away. Um, natural ecosystems also change very much based on water avail availability, uh, proximity to open water. But what's important to remember also is that the way that we use land affects the water resources that are available downstream. Um, and both natural and uh, human-dominated ecosystems do affect water resources. And the idea that we might actually be able to manage our water resources based on the land cover upstream is not a new idea at all. Um, and in fact, watershed protection is exactly this idea of um, hydrologic services and promoting hydrologic services. But one of the problems is that we're not doing a great job of protecting ecosystems, and part of the reason for that, at least, is that many watersheds are in private hands, and so it's difficult to regulate how people are actually managing the lands on them. And one of the things that I think is so exciting about ecosystem services and hydrologic services in particular is that it opens up the possibility for new ways to think about land management and water. So what I'm doing is working on the dry side of the Big Island. Um, there are no perennial streams on this side of the island. All of the water resources are groundwater resources. And the area where all of this water is being used is by and large in coastal areas. Um, the town of Kailua Kona uh, has a municipal water system that's based on groundwater. And they're using water that um, enters the water system from rainfall up in the mountains, up at about 3,000 feet in elevation. Um, and in Kona, they're very concerned about drinking water. Um, they're extracting water for municipal use, so use in households, use in um, light industrial use. And one of the things that they're most concerned about is water quantity. Um, there, it, there are water quantity problems in this area. They've started to have some saltwater intrusion problems because of overpumping wells, and there's been some concern about limits on development because of insufficient water. And so um, what we're thinking about in this context is the delivery of water supply. So this water is entering um, the, 
it's moving through ecosystems to become usable drinking water, and it's the quantity is the part of that that's so important. And the way that this connects to landscapes is that ecosystems affect the quantity of water that's available to become drinking water supply through local climate interactions and through water use by plants. And I want to take a minute here just to emphasize that what I'm not talking about is macro scale climate interactions. We're not talking about the kind of models where somebody um, imagines the entire Amazon basin being deforested and rainfall changing. This is parcel scale. These are privately held. Um, tracts of land where somebody might consider changing um, a forest, a natural forest into plantation forestry, um, where parts of a parcel might be developed residentially. Um, so we're not going to be changing rainfall patterns here, but what we are changing are local climate interactions um, and, and vegetation. And so to bring this back to Kona, what's happening is these eco-hydrologic processes are happening up in the mountains where we're seeing rainfall. Um, affecting water quantity, the, water is, the, the volume of water is moving through um, the aquifer where it eventually becomes water supply, where it is eventually provided to people um, in the coastal areas. And so part of what's also really cool about this is that diverted water supply is certainly not the only kind of hydrologic service that you might think of people being concerned about. It's one of really, I think, five broad classes of hydrologic service. Um, in a place where you had accessible open water, you could think of in situ water use. Um, water that's used for hydropower isn't actually removed from a stream, but you still need to have sufficient quantity of it in order to be able to run your turbines. Um, water damage mitigation is also very much related to water quantity. Um, too much water is what makes a flood, and so you're trying to control water quantity in that sense. Spiritual and aesthetic uses, so uses of water that are um, non-use is how they're usually described in economic terms, um, and also supporting services. Terrestrial ecosystems are very important in terms of providing um, the amount of water and also the quality of water that ends up in estuaries and for productive secondary uses. Um, so quantity is something that's an attribute of each of these services, and the volume of water that's available is in and of itself not beneficial or detrimental, because more water might be good for water supply, but bad for when you're talking about flooding, when you're talking about water damage mitigation. And so um, the value really comes into play when we start talking about the service itself, not about the attribute or the eco-hydrologic process. Those are um, biological or natural things that are happening, and as we think about the ecosystem service, it's the, that's where the value comes into play. And of course, quantity isn't the only kind of attribute that each of these services requires. It's one of several. So we can think about water quality. Um, the location of water in Kona, we don't, we're not so concerned about the location of water because it all ends up as groundwater in this case. The substrates are very young. And like I said, you don't see any perennial streams on that side of the island. Um, the timing of flow can also be a real issue, the seasonality of water availability and whether or not water is available when you need it. Um, quality is also not a direct issue in, in Kona, where I'm working because the water table is so far below the surface at the source areas, but it's something that's very important in many places. Um, and each one of these attributes is connected to a variety of eco-hydrologic processes. Um, in Kona, what I'm doing is really just focusing on the diverted water supply, on water quantity, and really on the eco-hydrologic processes that are affecting water quantity. So the source areas in Kona are at about 3,000 feet, just above the copy belt. And um, there's really only two kinds of land cover up in these areas where you're seeing it rain. We have native ohia forest and open pasture. Um, it's a kukuyu grass and uh, um, non-native species and some remnant ohia trees. And what I'm trying to do is really get a sense of how these two different kinds of land cover affect water availability and to try to understand what would happen if you changed these different kinds of land cover, either interconverted between them or thought about other kinds of conversion, so the potential for uh, converting into plantation forestry, uh, potentially into residential conversion. How is water availability downstream going to be affected by these kinds of land use changes? And I'm working in two separate sites. Uh, the northern sites are just Malka of uh, Keaho, basically. And the southern sites are Malka of Captain Cook. And um, they're very close together. There's a nice hard dividing line between the pasture and the forest. So macro scale at each pair, we're going to see basically the same climate. Um, but the vegetation is really different. And so I'm trying to look at sort of micro scale differences 
in, um, in water, in water input and water output. And what I'm doing is taking basically a water balance approach. Um, mass is definitely conserved here. So if water is entering the system as precipitation, it's either exiting, it's, it's being evapotranspired and returning to the atmosphere, or else it's going to infiltrate into the aquifer where it's eventually going to become useful. And it's that all of that's going to be mediated by the land cover. Um, you could get some storage, some water storage in land cover, but you're not going to see a lot of that, especially given that there's not huge swings um, in the climate over the course of the day or the year. So what I'm really focusing on is infiltration. That's what's important. That's the water that eventually people are going to be drinking. Fortunately, it's very difficult to measure that directly in these kinds of substrates. And so what I'm trying to do is really very carefully measure precipitation, so water input and evapotranspiration, water output, to get at how the land cover is affecting the amount of water that ends up in the aquifer and ends up being um, accessible as drinking water. Um, to do this, I've got a lot of weather equipment out there right now. Actually, I'm in the, uh, out in the pasture, I have rain gauges, and in the forest, I'm looking at through fall. So how much water is actually getting through that forest canopy and reaching the ground. And I'm also really interested in fog drip. How much, how much water is being intercepted in forests um, that's not being intercepted in pastures because of um, the trees and the roughness of the trees. These are very foggy sites on the side of the island. You can pretty much tell the time of day. One o'clock, the clouds are going to roll in, and it's going to be misty. Um, but it doesn't always rain. And so there's some interesting potential for different kinds of local climate interactions there. Um, in terms of evapotranspiration, I'm really taking an energy balance approach to this. Uh, the amount of water that's leaving the system through plant water use is primarily driven by sunshine, so how much, how fast are plants transpiring, and then wind. Is the moisture actually getting moved away from the plants and creating space for new moisture to move out? And so I'm using some pretty basic um, models that are used by the agricultural community to look at irrigation. Um, and measuring the weather in order to estimate the potential of evapotranspiration. If these plants are not water limited, how much water is moving through them back out into the atmosphere instead of ending up in the aquifer available for, you, for use by humans eventually. I'm also trying to get at actual evapotranspiration by using eddy cor correlation technology where I can actually measure directly um, sensible heat flux and, and water vapor flux. So little did I know that really what this meant was that I was going to be measuring the weather in very minute detail. Um, so I've built a lot of weather stations up in the mountains, um, and I'm measuring temperature and relative humidity, wind speed and direction, and precipitation at multiple elevations above ground surface um, in both the pasture and the forest. And then I've also recently installed some eddy co covariance um, instruments to try to get a sense at, of exactly what's going on um, with heat flux and with water vapor flux. Now, unfortunately, I, what I don't have for you today are some good answers about what this means on the biophysical side. Um, the rule of thumb in these cases is that trees use more water than pasture. And so you should be getting less infiltration into your aquifer underneath a forest than underneath um, a grassland. But Hawaii, all of the experiments that say that were done in temperate areas, not in the tropics. They were done in places where it's not humid. They were not done in places where you have the potential for a major fog input. Um, and they were done with trees that are very different than Ohia. And um, I think that there's a, a good chance that we don't know what's going on here. And that's one of the things that's really exciting about this. So hopefully I'll be back here next year to let you know exactly what's going on with the biophysical side. And in addition to that, um, the reason that this is really important, of course, is because people are using this water downstream, that it's an avenue for different ways to think about land management and conservation. Um, and so I'm starting um, a process of talking to people who are connected to the water district and to water users about what the value of changes in water supply are. And if we had changes in land cover and therefore changes in water availability, what that's going to mean for water users and how valuable that is. And given that, what kinds of institutional structures are available to actually try to compensate landowners for managing their land in different kinds of ways. And so for a conclusion, what I don't have for you is a golden answer about what the best kind of land cover is. But what I can say is that um, it's very clear that there's a need for the biophysical baselines of the kinds that I'm trying to measure. Um, 
as Gretchen said, there's a lot of questions about who pays for what. People always turn around and ask, well, what am I really getting? If I'm paying you for supplying water, what am I getting? And how is it going to be different if you do something else? And so having biophysical baselines is really important. Um, and then the second piece of the puzzle is about having information that's really applicable for decision makers. Um, the kinds of measurements that I'm making right now are certainly not novel. These are techniques that have been tried in lots of different places. But using them to get information that's going to be useful to decision makers, to planners, to landowners is really important. Um, disseminating that information and asking the kinds of questions um, that people that make decisions about land use need answers to matters quite a lot. And so with that, I just want to thank my sources of funding, um, my advisors and collaborators, without whom this wouldn't be possible, the landowners who have been so gracious to allow me to put all this crazy equipment up, on their, up in their forests and out in their pastures, um, and where I'm trying to keep it from being licked by the cattle. Um, and finally, my research assistant, without whom none of this could have happened. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs>